move on to our second deep dive, which um, is David Perdue is going to talk to us about discharge. Uh, thank you, Liam. Um, so we're starting off actually with um, the care conundrum. So acute hospital care for older patients saves lives. Planned care for older patients helps them to remain independent. Staying in hospital after they're medically fit is hazarded for many, hazardous for many older patients. And large numbers of patients stay in hospital longer than appropriate because meeting their health and social care needs in the community is not possible. So this is some work done by NEQUAS, which looked at uh, the adverse effects of prolonged hospitalisation. So in terms of the work they did, and some lots of research is done about uh, deconditioning, so pre-admission levels of independence is quickly lost. So in the information they looked at, and they reviewed over 700 uh, patients, uh, those with three or more nights delay one in 10 will suffer actual harm. So that was mainly around falling in hospital, hospital acquired pressure ulcers, or some kind of infection due to being in hospital longer than they needed to be. So with the delay of five or more nights, one in five will deteriorate so badly they can't be discharged. Or they can't be discharged to their home or where they should be going. So their levels of care are increased the longer you stay in hospital. And then by 28 days, one in three will suffer harm. So that was a linear look at, actually, day three, you had a 1% rise every day in your risk of harm whilst you stayed in hospital. So this work is some work we're doing across safety, across the whole system. So we're also expanding this to actually, actually, if we have people delayed in hospital longer, then that affects flow through the hospital. So actually, what is the harm caused by being at home waiting for an ambulance and overcrowding in an emergency department? Or actually, if we discharge people to the wrong place? So actually, if you put somebody in a residential home when they should be at home, then they will continue to decondition. And there's evidence to show that actually by doing that, the people will remain in residential care rather than going to their own home. So what's the state of discharge care in the um, ICS and how does it compare with other places. Um, so we're classing this as the awful term of patients who do not meet the criteria to reside. So yesterday, um, our system had uh, just under 9% of our beds occupied by people who don't meet the criteria to reside. Now there's a large variation in that, ranging from systems, so um, from 25%, and that yesterday was 26%, and our lowest was actually 2.8% yesterday. Now, uh, with all of our systems, the majority are under 6%, and there are three that are over that. Where we compare to our uh, other regional ICBs, so the best in the rest of the patch is currently 14.6%, going up to 18.9%. So we have a very strong performance uh, in terms of people not meeting the criteria to reside. So when we've looked at all of these, um, and these are my kind of review of all the data, talking to people, looking at actually what we need to do, these are our factors in safe, effective discharge. So recognition that home is best for the majority of older people leaving hospital. Care must be tailored to meet the needs of the individual and not arranged for organisational convenience. So there's lots of work looking at strength-based assessment and approaches. So treat a person with what they've got, which is a positive, rather than treating a person as what is negative. And that includes their social environment in terms of uh, who cares for them um, and what support mechanisms they've got uh, in place. So we need to use all the funded options must be available. So looking at personal health budgets, um, integrated personal budgets, or via commissioned services. We have a constant focus on maximizing independence for all post-discharge recovery and support services. We have a positive collaborative system leadership with clear vision, trusted by partners, and a determination to solve problems and blur boundaries as necessary. 
and we'll talk a bit around that one because actually that's the approach we have taken um, with the discharge funding that we've had. So performance metrics must be based on the outcomes for service users, not individual organisation indicators. And preparation for discharge begins at the point of admission. And then good post-discharge care can only be provided by flexible, multidisciplinary, multi-agency working. So we look at... There's a slide missing for some reason. Ah, sorry. Mm. Um, so we look at data but actually we need to know what people are saying about their process and what happened. So this is a mixture of people's um, inpatient picker surveys in terms of the questions around discharge and some work that we're having working with Healthwatch. Um, so what must we stop doing is allowing people to get lost in the overall pressure of day-to-day -day operations. Move people to other wards, hospitals, or care homes without discussion with individual families or carers, and then keeping people in hospital when they want to and could go home. So part of this work was looked at the paternalistic nature still of acute provision, and actually the um, clinician knows best. That's not always the case at all. And we've seen that in a lot of work that we've done in terms of over prescription of care requirements for people when they go home. So what should we do is ensure that we provide clear information at all stages of the inpatient stay. Follow the basics of good discharge. People go home to their own property with medications and it's a reasonable time of day. So I've been looking at discharge for the past 12 years as an acute provider and that comes up every single time. We don't seem to be able to get to take home medications on time, and we still discharge people after 10 o'clock at night. Make sure planned discharges take place unless the person becomes unwell. Ensure transfers of care to other providers are accompanied by accurate and up-to-date information relevant to the person being transferred. Improve the understanding of discharge to assess across our staff and our communities. Provide every person who is discharged as a named professional who knows about the person's medical care plan and can discuss this with the individuals and families. And then finally, foster a learning environment that is open to feedback and tackles issues. So we can look at all the data we want, but actually the people involved in this process know better than we do. So in just in terms of discharge in the national context, um, COVID-19 what a massive change to discharge from hospital and how we were enforced to do that. So there's a massive focus on freeing up hospital beds. So discharge to assess in place at pace was fully funded. And there were set time scales for discharge. So when it first came out, actually, if you were fit for discharge, you were going by 12 o'clock that day. Reiterated the need for seven day working clear set up of action cards. So we still have those action cards which tells every single person what they should do um, in terms of discharge. And we suspended CHC assessments, so that's continuing healthcare assessments. In August that same year, that became the fully hospital policy. And then a further update to include reference to community designated settings, funded changes, and increased focus on carers. And we are still waiting um, the latest discharge policy, which was due kind of in the middle of the summer, is still yet to be launched. But actually, in terms of some of the changes and what it tells us, is there's still now, now no requirement to discharge to assess, but it is seen as best practice. Um, so focus on home-based, strength-based approaches and the need to consider carers. And then in terms of transfer of care hubs, um, People should not routinely be moved out of hospital to free up beds. However, there is no right to remain in hospital if care is no longer required. So there's a, an escalation process for that, which there's three letters that are given to patients as they arrive, if you follow the patient process properly, which tells them and clearly states that actually if you stay in hospital, if you're fit, you should be leaving hospital. But we have to offer choice to waste in alternative settings if choice of provider or care at home is not available. So this is a really difficult one that I think people on the group, um, 
kind of even trust really struggle with because actually going to a place which is going to be your long-term residence is like moving home, isn't it? What we don't want to do is put somebody in a temporary accommodation to move them somewhere else. But actually, that is the process that we should be following. But very difficult. And some of those conversations are hard and don't always take place when they should take place. So in terms of funding, there's no national funding. It's the local areas to agree. And there are suggestions of pooled resources with social care through Section 75 or use of the Better Care Fund. And we clear how those funding changes duties will be met in discharge to assess. And then in terms of Care Act, we have to always have consideration should be given to the Care Act duties, particularly in Sections 2 and 3, which is around prevention and carers and integration. And in terms of other things, there's non-explicit reference to joint commissioning strategy or balance of independence and risk. But all areas need to have an exec lead, a system coordinator and transfers of care hubs. And the mental health services were excluded from the first part of this, but encouraged to adopt the same principles. So actually, in terms of understanding the discharge pathways, in terms of if you don't meet the criteria to reside, there's four pathways. So pathway zero is the person's able to return home with no support at all. And that should be 50% of the discharge for people over 60. Um, and the ward staff and the obviously clinician makes that decision in terms of those people going home. So one of the things we're looking at in terms of pathway zero is the time of those people going home. So actually we'll free up far more beds if we discharge people by 12 o'clock midday. The data's turn as we still discharge people majority after 12 midday and more than likely after five o'clock at night. Pathway one is the need for support to return home. Um, that's 45% of discharges for people over 65. Um, and again, that's ward-based staff with support from transfer of care hubs. So that's people who need a care package of some description at home. Pathway two is further rehabilitation in a bedded setting. And that's 4% of discharges for people over 65. And then that's the therapist and transfer of care hub. The professionals make that decision. And then pathway three is a new placement into a nursing or residential care home. Uh, and that should be 1% of discharges for people over 65. And that's a transfer of care hub. We must clarify why a pathway one or pathway two is not an option. So we shouldn't be discharging people directly into long-term residential or nursing care. And it's where that assessment takes place. So one of the biggest things around discharge is not to admit patients in the first place and to look at admission avoidance. So there's community-based health and social care. So that's the integrated care hubs. There's a two-hour emergency response system and then adult social care and short and long-term services. So from our ambulance providers, um, more impact on see and treat. So don't convey to hospital and look at alternative approaches and pathways in terms of a director of services which will off offers a different view to going straight to hospital and from a primary care perspective timely support for citizens um, and enhanced support for care homes and in terms of our turnaround services there's same day emergency care centers and home first teams so that's teams that are multi-professional so social workers therapists nurses working into emergency departments to turn people around rather than admit them because once you're admitted, we'll do every test, no demand, and you will stay in hospital far longer than you need to. So part of um, the government made special funding allocation of £500 million pounds, um, to systems, um, and our share of that was just over £27 well, million. Pounds. And that money went through the Better Care Fund, and what we did, um, we looked at the primacy of place. So the funding, so some funding came straight to social care, uh, to give you through the Better Care Fund. Other money came through the ICB. And how we did it, we looked at that money, we used the same approach as the social care allocation. So we got 15% of the population in the patch, we got 16% worth of funding. And part of that was kind of our deprivation levels, which allowed us to have that additional money. But we gave that 
designated all that to place, um, and the place director is working with the local authorities, voluntary sectors, and the acute trust to decide how that money was best spent. So we had to go through the Better Care Framework um, as a Section 75, and the Better Care Framework, in, in essence, uh, was set up to enable the right care in the right place and at the right time. So the implementation of the Better Care Fund was to introduce capacity and demand planning for intermediate care to help winter system preparation, and the over half a billion for ICSs. So that money, um, we looked at actually what was the need, we could just delegate it to IC, um, to health and wellbeing boards, but actually we had an assurance process that came back through the ICB to look at actually what was being spent, was it being spent in the right places that would support people to get to where they needed to be. And we had to put the final um, return back on the 16th of December. If that return was late, so we had half the money at that point, if the return was late or we didn't fulfil what we should be fulfilling, there was a risk we wouldn't get the second part of the money. They all well went in on time. Um, so just in terms of the breakdown, that's where the money, money was across 13 places. <coughs> and in terms of how it was used, um, these are the scheme types in terms of how we looked at that funding. Um, so there's a mixture of residential place settings additional capacity uh, for current care workers in place, assisted technology, bed-based alternative intermediate care, home care and domiciliary care, improved retention of existing workforce, increased hours by the existing workforce, local recruitment incentives, and then other voluntary services support, and reablement in people's own home. So that was the split of money and how it was set out. And the next two slides just show kind of where that is in the individual places. Um, this needs updating, I'll update it to make it all to 100%. Um, we then had further monies come through. So there was a share of 200 million came through, which our ICB got 11.4 uh, million. Um, and that was very specific and its use of that was for four weeks paid care, either in a bed base and then when we push back to say actually bed base doesn't help, it then was four weeks of a package of care. So that money ends at the kind of end of um, March, but actually in reality at the beginning of March. But what we had with that money, that's a very different process. So that has come to the ICB and it's a drawdown if you use that money. But as you see from what we've done before, we'd actually invested a lot of the other monies in those two pathways. So we're now looking at actually how we can utilise this money more effectively across the system. So in terms of the monitoring of metrics are being introduced, um, so this is the metrics for the first um, 500 million split. Um, so it's looking at the number of people discharging their usual place of residence, the absolute number of people not meeting the criteria to reside and who have not been discharged, Number of bed days lost to delay discharge by trust. The proportion of bed base in each trust occupied by patients not meeting the criteria reside. And then the number of care packages purchased for care homes, domiciliary care and intermediate care. So we do that return every fortnight. The last one being yesterday, which assures we get the funding for the next stage. The extra 200 um, million split, 11.4, is a daily template with 43 lines of data required to get the money. So I've seen lots of templates in my time. <laughs> this has to be um, one of the most complex templates I've ever seen and not very easy to fill in. But here it is being done with Sport of Next. Um, I think it's really important what we, sh we share, what we've learned as a system. So part of the discharge process was 10 high impact interventions for discharge. So we looked at those where every organisation had self-assessed and then I've done some peer reviews of those and looked at the learning across the different systems. Um, 
we have daily director of place meetings at four o'clock every day, shared by me, um, which actually have been really helpful and useful for the system to look at actually where the key issues are and actually early heads up of issues. So that might be early heads up of actually cares becoming a problem in a certain patch. And then what can we do about that? So actually, what have we done in terms of in enhancements, incentives for carers to work in that particular area? Um, but we've actually shared good practice. So some of the highest performers in this area have actually looked at what we can move across and what can easily be implemented in different places. Um, we have really good multi-agency working. It's worked really well. And actually when issues have been raised, we've looked at them and what we can do different. So one of the key ones for this is actually when is a person not meeting the criteria to reside. So actually just because a consultant's done a ward round or they've done additional ward rounds on a Friday morning and we have 37 people added to the list, actually those 37 people weren't all ready to be discharged. So actually there was a lot of to and fro in and uh, people actually weren't medically fit on the list and actually our social care colleagues were taking lots of time validating a list instead of actually doing the work. So actually we took a an action from that and looked at a SOP to actually how we work together to get them right. It's one version of the truth. And actually come out of this is actually some other pathways that we need to do some work on as a system. So one of those is around rehabilitation and actually what are our, is it our rehabilitation offer as an ICB, especially for specialist rehabilitation and what we need to do differently. Uh, we've got a task and finish group taking on that piece of work. And we also looked at repatriation and actually what does repatriation really mean? It's just because somebody might have a Sunderland postcode but actually they live closer to Gateshead and end up in Gateshead. Well, actually, are they repatriation? No, they're not. But actually we need to look at the systems and actually have some trusted assessment that actually you don't have to travel as a social worker from Sunderland to Gateshead. We have a shared vision of what that assessment is and we trust it. And then obviously we've had feedback from people's experience and learning. So with all of this, we'll have some negatives that people feel that they've been discharged too early in the process. Um, and we've gone through those um, and reviewed them and are doing some learning from those. Um, but I have to thank um, all the key players in this, the directors of place for their leadership and the local authorities and the voluntary sector for the work that they've all put in um, to make this as successful it has been. So when we started the process, we had 11% of our beds occupied. We're down to nine. At our best point, we're at 8.2. But actually, it's quite interesting when you look at all the data. So actually, our, our lowest percentage was the week after Christmas, when we had the joyful reduction of people wanting to go home. When you look to our other regional colleagues, they were sitting at kind of mid-teens to high-teens, theirs went down to less than 5%. Actually, ours only went down to 6.6%. .6%. So actually, it shows that actually the system runs well, that there isn't a massive variation. Um, one of the key things is around mental health. So we did a 100-day challenge uh, for acute providers in the summer. At the moment, our two mental health organisations are going through um, the 100-day challenge. Um, and these are the 10 high-impact interventions that are now being focused on mental health provision. Um, our two mental health providers have got a very different um, uh, data and information in terms of people who are delayed. One at the top of the, uh, as in worst performer, one who's the best performer but that needs to look at individual processes and how they're being done. And in terms of the funding, um, 1.3 million pounds of that funding was dedicated to mental health and mental health provision. So looking at all the information and what we've got, um, we've got four key strategies going forward in terms of our strategic plan for discharge. One is this to improve the data accuracy. We'll have a uh, this is a short clip from Optica. 
Um, but actually that's really important. So that single version of the truth in terms of data, but also actually data coming out of the acute providers in terms of the actual delays, but actually what the bed numbers are. So actually we've got some really um, interesting daily returns to the Department of Health um, that shows some of our organisations have got less beds than they should have, and some have got more beds than they should have, which obviously, um, so there's some work and in the individual organisations where that applies to are being supported through that process. There's a key bit on seven day working and how we do seven day working across all of our systems and that's in health and social care, especially in terms of community response. Um, escalation in terms of um, we've had escalation meetings at weekends at the worst point of this when we asked social care to join that um, they did but actually it wasn't helpful because we didn't have the right metrics and looking at that so there's some work we're doing around um, opal levels in terms of health and social care so we have an understanding of where we are and then the biggest issue for us is workforce in terms of our one workforce how do we get people into the care setting um, and currently we pay um, the lowest wages to people looking after some of our most complex patients um, so we've got a strategic piece of work uh, around workforce planning that Steph Downey uh, leads as the DAS for workforce who works really close with me um, and Annie's team to look at actually what are we going to do across the system and then from a learning um, aspect we've got a um, meeting that Annie and Ajaz are working with me to look at a learning event from discharge uh, on the 9th of March so there are now two quick films um, first one is around optic Okay, so Optica, what Optica does is it pulls all the information around all our patients that we've got within the trust into one place. So it pulls everything from our EPR system. What then happens is the wards will define whether they meet the criteria to reside in hospital or whether they don't, and then we'll update that on the EPR system. What then that happens is that pulls that information of those patients into this very succinct list of patients that we know we're trying to progress the discharge. What then happens is, is that for each of those patients, we can break down exactly the tasks that we're doing for discharge. Discharges can be very complicated. Some are very simple, but some involve multiple agencies, multiple steps. So what we can actually do is track those steps, steps in real time and look at who's responsible for the next step. So what it does is it stops the drift of time between those steps and allows us to really understand who's responsible for it, where we are with it. I think prior to having Optica, <clears throat> we tried to monitor this through the Excel spreadsheets, but we've been more measuring in days. Now we can measure the tasks in hours, which is clearly going to reduce that length of stay. It allows me as head of patient floor to look at where the bottlenecks are and actually look at where we need to escalate to, to actually get that patient moved through. It gives us that visibility in one place of everything that we need to do for a patient's discharge. Optica pulls information from different IT systems and it also means that it's visible and usable for different elements of the pathway, whether it's in the acute side of things or whether it's in the community, they all have access to Optica. So for example, you know, we might be waiting for the patient for a bed and one of the community teams might be trying to find that. They can then, they know that they're waiting for a bed because Optica is telling them that and then they can update Optica that tells us that actually that bed is now available so we can then liaise with our ward teams. Previously, what we'd have to do is we'd have to be ringing them to say, have we got a bed? No, we haven't. Okay, I'll ring you back later. You know, we, it's taken away this kind of to and fro and of communication. So it's actually helped with that communication, it being accessible to all. So it's accessible to the local authorities. It's accessible to our single point of access. It's on the wards, it's in the discharge team and actually everybody can see that same set of information about that patient. I think when we look at our data in terms of the uh, at North Tees and Hartlepool, what, what we've seen since the introduction of Optica is that we've been able to, say for example, maintain our 
percentage of patients over 21 days to around about 10% for the last year. The national um, target is 12% and I think other trusts nationally, we've seen a big rise in the numbers of 21 days over the last 12 months, whereas ours is really very stable. The other thing that we can see is that um, for those patients over 21 days, what we've managed to do is reduce the number of days delays as well. So what we can see by our national reporting is that we've actually, you know, one patient pre optica might have been delayed by 15 days. We've actually managed to get that down and you can see this very visible through our data. So in terms of the patients, they're getting out quicker, they're getting to where they need to be for their recovery and rehabilitation. Kind of want to come to work. We were all very passionate about what we do. Um, as much as yeah, it is a job at the end of the day, um, but we like helping people. We're all very caring people. And then at the end of the day, the, the residents of our borough. Um, so we've all got to look after each other. But in terms of myself, how do I feel? I, I'm just enjoy. I just enjoy coming to work. So we triage referrals from Nortes and other hospitals in the local area um, in order to support with people discharging from hospital, home with packages of care or into beds for rehab or assessment to look at their care needs if it's going to be unsafe for them to go home. We have good integration work, integrated working with the, our NHS colleagues, um, direct community health staff, we all sit together as a triage team and the places where we can, the options that we've got for care that we can go to um, are very varied. We, we're one big team, so we're able to, to tap into lots of different areas. It's not just us on our own. The relationships with the external um, organisations uh, are very, very good. We do have a lot of obviously good relationships with managers in the care homes. The, we have like partners for care and uh, five lamps. Uh, in Stockton who deal with our discharge to assess packages of care pathway um, and they're very good we can get in touch with them. We've built up a good good relationship um, so I think that stems to a, a good flow of um, discharges and getting people out of hospital and um, to whichever pathway they go down. We do also have an 11 o'clock meeting um, with the discharge team at North Tees um, and that runs Monday to Sunday um, and it's more to discuss the, uh, the, the patients that we currently have on the list ready to leave hospital or close to leaving. The hospital has an IT system that we have now got access to and that's instant so even alongside the 11 o'clock if we find out a about discharges, we can add to that system and everybody can see it straight away. So whether you're working from home or in the office or on a hospital day, then we can add that detail in and everybody knows what's going on at that time. So alongside the 11 o'clock, that's a new addition, a good new addition to it, to keep everybody in the loop. So one of the things that we've done recently, we've just um, had two new posts a social worker Helen and a social care officer Wendy so that means we've got a team directly on the wards um, who were able to complete those assessments and they also complete um, the communication on our system so then we can go on our system look at what what they've written and um, go from there. But two minutes of your time can make a huge difference to somebody's life really because um, it is about their life at the end of the day and two minute phone call can make a huge difference and that's I think kind of what we're, we're all about really. Sometimes things go so smoothly and you think yes like you've, you've done that and you've, you've got that person into a placement that they wanted to go to and it's happened really quickly and, and obviously there is challenges um, some, some of the time but when you get over those challenges as well, that, that does feel good. <laughs>
make your questions and comments brief, and we'll build, we'll bring them all together, uh, David, and and if you could make a note and answer them as you go along. So Tom was first, I think. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, there is a there is a nice guideline on this very topic around transition mm -hmm. uh, between inpatient hospital settings and the community, and the and the associated quality standard as well. Yeah. One of the key elements is around information on admission yeah. as well. And um, so obviously you've touched on how people are tracked through and obviously relationships are key to that information sharing. What about at the f very front end when actually that guides what the hospital stay looks like and you can start planning for discharge from from uh, day zero, really? Eileen. Thanks, David. That was a really spectacular presentation. Uh, my point is really about some other nice guidance that I was part of the development of, which was about excess winter deaths and cold homes, NG6, I think it was. It was developed in 2015, and that was way before a cost of living crisis. I mean, one of the issues that can be a blocker is the idea of people going home to uh, poor, uh, heat, poorly heated homes. We live in a northern climate. We've got poor housing stock, and many people are uh, economically deprived. And I guess it's a challenge for us as a system. What can we do uh, about that? Are we able to prescribe support for energy bills, et cetera? Because for staff and for people and for families, particularly with older residents who are sometimes reticent to put the heating on, we know that going home to a cold home can actually exacerbate their underlying health conditions. Thank you. Anne. Anne. Sorry, Liam. Sorry, thank you. Um, there's probably loads that I, I would say on, on discharge, but first of all, to see how proud I am of the staff who did that video. They were very nervous. Um, I think one of them, Emma, uh, was actually a PA support to me in 2008. Um, so to see her in the role that she's in is fantastic. Um, I won't repeat some of the things that have come through in the presentation, but certainly just to, to remind board that these discharge teams are very small. So they're very small groups of staff. Um, the model uh, within uh, North Tees using Optica is superb uh, in terms of having one version of the truth. So the data that Graeme spoke about earlier on, just that we don't argue over who's on whose list. And I think the criteria to reside medically optimised as a social worker, I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, safe and planned uh, for me is about getting people very safely back to their home, their bed, um, or wherever the best place is. So lots of work, uh, I think, been involved in lots of daily ICS um, mm -hmm. search calls, uh, regional calls, and national calls in terms of discharge. And certainly we've got a lot to be proud of, uh, and certainly coming through Christmas and New Year, and hearing the sharing of information, the sharing of support has been um, second to none. Um, still got a long way to go, lots of challenges, workforce in, in particular, as David's already covered. Um, but I think we've got a lot to be proud of. Thank you. Okay, David. David, you want to respond so oh, far, sorry. and then we've got other <laughs> right. comments coming. Yeah. Um, so in terms of front end, Tom, I suppose that's one of the principles we said at the start, is actually because of discharge starts on admission. Um, so that is really important that people are bringing the right information into hospital. Um, but we'll pick that up as a kind of one of the task force we look at, especially for the mental health patients. Um, and just in terms of people going to their own home, um, this is uh, an interesting one in terms of kind of heating and if there's heating there, it's actually how we encourage people to use it. So we do flag to kind of uh, voluntary sector, citizens advice and all the different support that people can get when they go home uh, so they are safe in their own home. Um, but it's quite interesting in terms of some of our paternalistic nature in terms of what is the right home or home environment, especially people who like to hoard. Actually, they've lived in that environment for years. And actually, we just need to ensure that actually the people are safe when they go back. Okay, um, we can't run over time because we've got the guest speaker. So I'll ask you to be, don't, you don't have to put your flags <laughs> down, but just be brief, ages. Can you hear me? Uh, great. Um, very quickly, joining the dots with the previous presentation and uh, question that David Chandler asked earlier, I, I think uh, I'm really interested in uh, specifically the avoidance, you know, um, uh, admissions avoidance, and I think a, a role that good data could, you know, combine data as well as the, there's some very interesting opportunities around the use of predictive analytics and artificial intelligence there that, that we could apply to as our data capabilities grow to increase some 
you know, interventions that, that can, can help target people who are likely to end up in hospital early enough to uh, get some opportunities exploited. Thank you. David Thompson. Thank you. I think the whole presentation uh, reinforces the need for uh, information, appropriate information, to be brought to the Integrated Care Board on social care. <coughs> I appreciate it is not easy because the ICB doesn't have any direct responsibility for social care and care homes tend to be independent, but to bring information to, to help with the insight and therefore the action to this board and to place boards would be very, very useful, uh, not least because it will be true integration. Thank you, David. John? Just talking about people and partnerships. <clears throat> if anybody wants a crash course in how to work in partnership at an integrated level, I suggest they get involved in this process because you see demonstrated both fantastic behaviours and some very toxic behaviours of passing buttons and blaming and everything. So the only thing I was just probably wanted to say is, is that this is where the, the, I use the phrase of organisational empathy, understanding how each other organisation, their roles and responsibilities is a key part of this. Um, but it's one that I think we're working our way through uh, and I commend anybody who's having to work in those environments because I don't think we appreciate the, the, the upset, the concern and sometimes the joy that they, that they felt there. So, yeah, if you want to do it both strategically and operationally, go and do something in this because this is real hard work. Thank you, John. Annie. My point is linked to a number of those. And thanks for the presentation, David. I, I noticed how the mood in the room changed when we had a chance to watch the films and actually listen to Phil. Um, and it made me think of, do we know enough about how many Phil's there are out there across the system? Because my bet is if Phil was looking after my mum or dad, he would be doing it in a very special way. Um, so it's about elevating our ambition, I wonder, about how we systematically capture workforce experience, understand the social work experience in the process of, and, and community teams experience, bringing people out of hospital, informal carers, um, and their contribution to our workforce across the patch. How much do we really know about that experience and, and our opportunity to integrate it with the quality of patient experience against the key actions that are defined in our strategy. So I think we have an opportunity to really stretch our ambition in terms of what we measure to give us the insight. Um, and I guess people like Phil will, will inspire us to action. So thanks for the presentation. Sam. Thank you, Chair. Three, three quick points for me. I was really struck looking at the pie chart and also how people have used the money and I was drawn to the areas and particularly Sunderland on assistive technology and also Northumberland so I'm really curious through the learning forum that we're doing as part of our learning and health system approach what the learning is from, from that and it links to the point Eileen made earlier around the sort of evaluating the impact of it. Um, carers I know they're on your agenda as well, David, and it, I, was, I was minded throughout the whole presentation thinking about it from the carer's perspective as well, and I think that's probably an area it would be good for us to look at again at some point in the future. And then just finally on digital, and it's a bit of a golden thread today, um, <coughs> unwittingly, the presentation we had as a board from Mark Britnell on the sort of the 10 essential aspects of high-performing integrated care systems one of them was around standardising guidelines and operating procedures. So the, the things like repatriation, discharge policies, whatever hospital you go into in our system, we should be working to a standard set of procedures. And then also our sort of digital operating model. So Optica, it's a tried, proven, tested technology. We've now got all but one of our NHS trusts signed up to implementing that over the next period. And I was sort of going to go away with renewed effort to get the final trust in because I do think part of this is about how we make things simpler for patients, for families and carers, but also staff who we know our workforce 
it's very transient in some places and we can save ourselves a lot of time if we're working to more standardised sets of procedures and can it be good to pick that up with you through the provider collaborative? Okay, these have to be the last three interventions. So uh, David Stout, Graham and Jane. David. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, Liam. David, given, what, given the lessons you have learned but the challenges that are out there, how optimistic are you that we can actually make good progress in the near future, next year. Graham. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just two very quick points. David, in terms of your variation with the two incumbent mental health trusts, good piece of uh, recent development is to the appointment of a CIO that will work between the two trusts. That will instill some degree of standardisation. And to Eileen's point about keeping people warm at home, we have been involved in a national initiative in the Tees Valley to do exactly that. Well, I'll get some more information to you, Eileen. Thank you. Jane. Just for information on the carers agenda, NHS England Personalised Care Leads commissioned us to work with Northumbria University on a, a year-long piece of research which has just been completed around carers' experiences of discharge. And we involved um, eight trusts across the four ICSs across northeastern Yorkshire and a significant number of carers from each of those patches. And the, as the, the report is not only setting out people's experiences and the carers experiences are very illuminating but also drawing together um, the, the the discharge practice um, the best practice and also production of a toolkit around how to which we hope will be um, showcased and used um, to try to improve practice because we obviously found it varied in many places happy to bring That'd that to you thank you well thank you a lot of very helpful comments insights pointers to the future um, not that many direct questions, but there was one at the end, which is how optimistic are you, David? Answer that one and then we'll move on. Um, so I think if we keep the trust that we've developed with the systems and the strategic pathways that we're looking to focus on, then I'm really optimistic. And actually, uh, the discharge funding in terms of the initial funding will, is due to continue. So that's a, a big step in terms of that focus. But I do think um, it is absolutely the people at place who have made this work. Thank you, David. And thank you to you and your team for a, an excellent piece of work. Thank you.